Good evening, everyone. And thank you so much for being here in spite of this crazy Houston weather. We've had more rain this year than, well, the last three years combined, I think. I hope nobody had any flood issues or anything. Um, so welcome to our last program of the season. I'm very happy to see so many people showed up. Um, so our program tonight is on the current conflict in Yemen, uh, which seems to be collapsing into a civil war. Our speaker tonight, Ms. Sama Al Hamdani, will give us an update on the current situation in Yemen and discuss some of the key players and their roles in this conflict. Ms. Al Hamdani is an independent writer, researcher, and analyst focusing on Yemeni politics. Her work has been published in Al Monitor, uh, Yemen Observer, Brookings Lawfare Blog, the Atlantic Council's Mina Source, and several other publications in academic journals. Um, she is also a regular expert commentator on major international media outlets, including CNN International, BBC World Service, Al Jazeera, and the Huffington Post. Uh, please join me in thank, uh, welcoming Ms. Al Hamdani. Hello, good evening. Um, thank you for that introduction, and thank you all uh, for being here. I saw the rain. That is a lot of rain. Uh, this is my first time in Houston. I've gotten just a great and wonderful impression of the people here, and I'm very happy to see a lot of people ask me questions about Yemen. Uh, I think I have a lot more interest uh, in Yemen here in Texas than I do in Washington, D.C. Um, so with that, I'd like to begin. Uh, we put, you know, in the introduction, uh, the conflict in Yemen, a Saudi-Iranian proxy war, question mark. A lot of the people here think that the war in Yemen is really just about a proxy between Iran and uh, Saudi Arabia playing out in Yemen. Uh, can you guys, can we do a show of hands of how many people actually think that's what's going on in Yemen? How many people feel like they don't know anything about Yemen? Great. Um, so I'm going to put a lot of visuals on to help you. This is kind of CNN style. We've realized a lot of people understand things with maps. So this is uh, a map of Yemen. It is south of Saudi Arabia. So right north of it, on top of it, is Saudi Arabia. Underneath it is the Red Sea. And uh, nearby it is Djibouti and Somalia. So right now in this current war, a lot of the Yemenis are on lockdown. They can't exit the country. Uh, a lot of them are taking ships onto Djibouti uh, or to Somalia. So a lot of the people who are escaping the war are entering these countries as refugees. Uh, a lot of countries are turning Yemenis down, though, uh, because they're not ready to absorb them, given that the rest of the Middle East is having other issues and crises, uh, Syria, Libya, Iraq, to name a few. Um, so. What you see, the portion that, is, that has a square around it, is where the majority of Yemen's population is. Uh, that is 24 million people out of 27, about 27 million people. Uh, this portion that has the rectangle in it used to be known as the north of Yemen prior to 1990. The other portion used to be called the south of Yemen. These two were two separate countries. So Yemen is a relatively young country that is 25 years old. So, since this war began, uh, which is in March of 2015, uh, a lot of things have been taking place on the ground. What you see before you is a map that was published on, in the New York Times, uh, and it was, it was uh, created by the American Enterprise Institute. The red dots that you see is where a Saudi-led coalition has targeted airstrikes into the country. Uh, the areas that you see shaded in orange are areas where Houthis or the, the militia that has taken over the country has control. And, and then you have areas where they're able to operate. So what you can see here is that there are red dots in areas where the Houthi militia does not uh, work or is able to operate. Um, so there's a, there's a lot of reasons that I'm mentioning this and I'm going to break them down one by one. So. The Operation Decisive Storm was the name given for this war that uh, was led by the Saudi Arabian-led um, coalition. The coalition was composed of nine countries. Uh, those countries are before you here on the map. So Sudan, Egypt, Morocco, Jordan, Kuwait, Bahrain, 
Uh, Qatar, the UAE, has participated actively in this war. Pakistan even sent some uh, planes into this war. Uh, some other countries reportedly wanted to join afterwards. Uh, a country that wanted to join was Indonesia and then Somalia. So the question is, why are all these countries participating in this war? Uh, first of all, this is a display for the Gulf to showcase that they are strong and they don't want Iranian influence in their region. Right? So this is a, an elaborate display of, of, of power. Um, a lot of these countries have been wanting to join is because there's a lot of money in this. Saudi Arabia has bought a lot of weapons to participate in this war. The countries that benefited the most from this war is actually the United States and France. Um, so what's ironic about this war is you have the wealthiest country in the Arabian Peninsula launching airstrikes on the poorest country in the Arabian Peninsula. The reason that they are doing this uh, remains uh, to be uh, it's actually several reasons that they claim to the media. So in the West, here in the United States, it is to uh, block Iranian influence in the region. Uh, in the Middle East, it is more to restore the legitimacy of uh, President Hadi, who is now in Riyadh, the capital of Saudi Arabia. The majority of Yemen's government is also in Riyadh. So a total of 400 Yemeni political personalities are now in Riyadh. So who are the Houthis? Who are these militia groups that Saudi Arabia is targeting? Uh, the Houthis are uh, backed by Iran. Uh, and here is where we have to understand how they operate on the ground. So in Syria, you have a proxy war where Saudi Arabia is, is fighting the, the Iranians on Syrian soil. What you have in Yemen is a little bit different. The Houthi group is a Yemeni group. It's a grassroots movement that started in the early 90s. It was a Zaydi revivalist movement. Uh, Zaydiism is a sect within the Shia, uh, part, Shia sect of Islam. Um, and what's interesting about the Zaydi sect is it's very different from Twelver Shia, which is the Shia in Iran. The Zaydiism is known as Fiver, Fiver Shia because they believe in the first five Imams, uh, while Twelver Shia believes in 12 Imams. And because they don't believe in a lot of Imams in between, that has caused a lot of turmoil between uh, Zaydiism and Twelverism. And as a matter of fact, in the past, Zaydis have came out and said that they consider Twelver Shia to be heretics because they do not believe in the 12 Imams. Uh, as of 2011, sectarianism started becoming a thing in Yemen, and it really is a manufactured process. Um, as early as the early 90s, the area where the Houthis were, uh, the first portion here of the map at the very top is the region where the Houthis are from. That area is known as Sada. Uh, Sada is a traditional Zaydi area. Um, in the early 90s and even in the 80s, a very big Salafi school, uh, Salafism is uh, uh, a, a form of Sunni Islam that is usually referred to as Wahhabism, uh, a school opened there and started bringing a lot of recruits into Yemen, which angered the Zaydi population of that area. To counteract that, uh, a Zaydi revivalist movement was born. And the Zaydi movement, uh, the founder of this movement was called uh, uh, was, was called al Houthi, therefore his, his last name was adopted, therefore we're calling the militia the Houthi militia. What they, what they prefer to be called is Ansar Allah, which means defenders of God. Um, the Houthis uh, got in six civil wars with Yemen's government. In the early 2000s, uh, they started creating tension in Sada. The government decided to fight them. Uh, in one of these six wars, Saudi Arabia direct, par directly participated in striking them down. Uh, they were really worried about having a Shia movement kind of create chaos very close to their border. Right on top of it is Saudi Arabia. Um, and so in 2011, Yemen had a revolution. What the revolution meant was that the former president of Yemen, President Ali Abdullah Saleh, stepped down after 33 years of ruling. And there was an opportunity, a golden time really, for several groups to come and participate in the political equation of Yemen. The Houthis were allowed entrance into the capital, Sana'a, to participate in a process called the National Dialogue Conference. In this National Dialogue Conference, they were granted several seats to talk about their case because they were viewed as a minority that were maltreated and mistreated and had a chance to kind of voice their grievances. 
So as early as 2011, they had some presence in Sana'a and they started operating as a political party. Um, so they took advantage of this opportunity to get into Sana'a. They were really effective in lobbying their concerns, uh, but at the same time, they didn't trust the process. While they were participating in the National Dialogue Conference, on the side, they were expanding militarily on the ground. So what you see here in July 2014, they really pushed out of their area and they started moving south. So they pushed into Amran, into, into the Mar, and they, and they were close to Sana'a. So in September 2014, they completely took over the capital, Sana'a. Uh, and it really did happen overnight. I remember calling my family and friends on the ground because we've already heard about the Houthis expanding, several wars taking place. Uh, and so the next day, I just wake up and they are in Sana'a. And so I called my family and everybody and I was like, how did they just take control of Sana'a? I expected them to tell me, oh, there was uh, a lot of war, there was a lot of resistance, but it was very simple. They just woke up and they were there. So out of nowhere, the Houthis were everywhere in the capital. Uh, they started positioning their own uh, soldiers uh, that they called the popular committees. Uh, those are committees that are composed of the local population who are in charge of security. Uh, so in front of ministries and other organizations, the Houthis were everywhere. They took over uh, military checkpoints because they did not trust the government uh, in taking care of the security of the population. When they took control of Sana'a, they also, uh, there, were, there were a lot of protests in Yemen about uh, a subsidy lift that President Hadi has put in place. So they capitalized on the anger of the people who demanded water and electricity. They used their concerns to go into the capital promising a return of these services. So when they entered to Sana'a, they were actually able to fulfill some of these promises. People suddenly had water, they had electricity, but of course the government was not able to carry out its duties while they were there. The, the government at that time resigned and a new government was created based on the demands of the Houthi rebel movement. So President Hadi then signed a treaty, a peace and partnership deal, that's what they called it, uh, with the Houthi rebels and they created a new government. So by November, finally, we had a list of names of a technocratic government that's never really happened in Yemen's history. Um, and so it took up until January for the parliament to okay this government. Uh, shortly after, the Houthis decided that they will expand a lot more than that. Uh, so in February, the president went under house arrest because there were clashes the night before that between Houthi forces and, and the president. Um, and he decided to flee to Aden, which is all the way down in the bottom. Aden used to be the capital of the south of Yemen prior to 1990. So here you can see that there was a cross from, from the president Hadi's side from what is the capital of, of Yemen into a capital of what used to be South Yemen. Uh, when the president showed up in Aden, the Houthi rebels were really angered that he escaped their house arrest and decided to go after him into the south. And that's when President Hadi showed up in Oman and then showed up right after it in Riyadh and shortly after the war began. So uh, the, these are the movements of the Houthi rebels. Now let's talk about their relationship with Iran for a minute. Uh, the Houthis are supported by Iran. To what extent is this support? Financially, the support that Iran is granting to the Houthis is not enough to create a link to say that the Houthis are obeying orders of Iran. As a matter of fact, it's not significant enough to the point that no newspapers anywhere in the world are writing about it. Uh, moreover, they, they have no actual presence on the ground. The only forces that have presence on the ground are generals and military leader, leaders of uh, Hezbollah, and that's a militia in Lebanon. What the Houthis did is they modeled themselves after Hezbollah in Lebanon. Uh, however, this is where this looks like a Yemeni operation to all experts who understand Yemen and the Middle East very well. Uh, Hezbollah, when, whenever they took control of the capital in Lebanon, Beirut, they would hand over a list of demands and when those demands are met, they would retract back to their area, which is in the south of Lebanon. The Houthis here came and took control of the capital, Sana'a, handed over a list of demands, and when they got them, they got greedy and decided to push forward. And that's really a Yemeni thing. I, 
Every expert has doubted that Iran has any hand in this. And as a matter of fact, Iran has not participated in this war so far, mainly because they want to sign the nuclear deal with the U.S. So as long as the deal is on the, is, is on the table, Iran is likely to uh, practice control and stay away from Yemen. Uh, also, in their interest, in Iran's interest, is to stay out of this area. I think that Saudi Arabia, when they started this war, what they unintentionally did is really invite Iran in very close to home. So, besides the Houthis and besides the government, which is now in Riyadh, we have another very active force on the ground in Yemen. The portion that is in blue is what used to be the south of Yemen, and the, portions, the portion that is in orange is what is the north of Yemen. In the south of Yemen, uh, we have a movement known as the Southern Separatist Movement. Uh, they have been demanding secession as early as 1994, but their voice got really loud in 2007 and then in 2009, and when the revolution took place in 2011, they really demanded that their grievances be met. So the Southern Hirak is a very interested, interesting coalition group. It's composed of different parties and factions that all fall under the umbrella name of the Southern Hirak. Uh, this map is very complicated. You don't have to read all of it, but it's just to give you an idea of how many leaders exist based on the region that they're in. This movement also has leaders that are outside of Yemen who have fled Yemen years ago, but still want to have influence on what's going on on the ground. The reason uh, their, their issues is very legitimate is because Yemen fell into war in 1994 and the southerners fought uh, with the northerners but what former President Saleh did is he used uh, some jihadis back in 1994 to help capture uh, the south of Yemen. And ever since the south of Yemen fell in the hands of the north, there has been a kind of uh, an alienation of so uh, southern forces in the government. So in the military, uh, they were put aside, a lot of them were put into early retirement, and they weren't able to get the jobs that they wanted. A lot of the Southerners who did participate in the government, the Southerners themselves on the ground felt that these Southerners were Northerners in their eyes. They weren't uh, good enough to be Southerners. One of these people is actually our current president, President Hadi. President Hadi is from the governorate of Abyan, right? There, there's a line and it says Abyan under it. That's where President Hadi is from. In 1994, he's an army general. He participated in the war and, and sided with the forces of former President Saleh. Here, it's important to note that President Hadi used to be President Saleh's vice president for many, many years. So this coalition or this group, the Southern Hirak, is also fighting on the ground. The reason this war got very, very tense is because the Houthis pushed into areas that are traditionally southern. Um, and so from the map that you saw before, the Houthis were able to take control of Yemen, of the north of Yemen, as early as September of 2014. But the war really started in 2015, and that's when they pushed into territories that are traditionally not their areas of operation. Uh, a lot of the parts that we saw earlier on, on the orange side, there is no, um, for example, in the capital Sana'a, there is no uh, local opposition that is actively fighting the Houthi rebel movement. You see that in areas like Taiz in the south, there's a lot of bloodshed going on there because the local population is fighting against them. And the local population is composed of several groups. And in some areas, Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula is participating in this war. However, they are all using each other as an excuse to fight each other, and I'll, and I'll delve into that later on when I talk about Al-Qaeda. Okay. So this is a, a photograph to show you the amount of damage that is being done. Let me quickly explain to you what is going on now in Yemen. Destruction in Yemen, all over the country, is happening due to two main reasons. One of them are the airstrikes led by Saudi Arabia, and the other reason is clearly the Houthi militia. Uh, so you have airstrikes coming in, and then several, several civil wars taking place on the ground. And this has led to death, deaths, injuries, displacement. Child soldiers are used on both ends on the ground. 
uh, schools have been occupied by militias, and hospitals are being hit by the Saudi airstrikes and by the Houthi militia. The only distinction here between these two is that we can say that the Houthi rebel movement, uh, they arrest activists on the ground, they've arrested journalists, they've arrested anybody who's going to speak against them. The Saudis, on the other hand, have uh, started a, a, a kind of deviation off of their plan. They started by targeting military sites. However, at the end of the war, we started noticing that they're hitting factories. They're hitting IDP camps. They have hit, um, as a matter of fact, just two days ago, uh, a UN building in Aden. Um, and they have also destroyed up to 25 historical sites. So. Uh, those sites are 2,500 years old uh, and they've they have museums and they've also destroyed uh, buildings that are part of the UNESCO World Heritage Site. And they've also destroyed what the Yemenis and Ethiopians believe is the hometown or the home uh, place of Queen Sheba. Uh, so far, it's very unfortunate that there is no accountability on either end. A lot of these crimes are going on in the name of war and in the name of uh, an Iranian-Saudi proxy war and in the name of restoring President Hadi's legitimacy to the ground. Um, so on the side of that, the situation in Yemen is, has gotten really bad. In 2011, 9 million people in Yemen were facing famine. As of recently, a statement made by the UN Special Envoy to Yemen, 21 million of Yemenis are facing famine. 30% of the people's income is going into buying fresh water to drink. Um, a lot of the houses can't even afford food because a small carton of yogurt has gone to be more expensive than a dollar. And during a time of war, there are no jobs, there are no schools, and there is no plan put in place to activate the role of civil society on the ground. A lot of the youth, a lot of the women are sitting at home and as a matter of fact, the only thing that is happening now, entering the fourth month of war, is that a lot of the young people that I know are faced with the question, which side of the war do I attach myself to? So these are two photos to just show you the, the different type of destruction that is being created in Yemen. The top four photos are uh, photos from Al Buraika port in Aden that was shelled by Houthi rebels. Um, they have uh, hit an oil distillery there, and it's been burning for two days. Uh, on the bottom here are photos of an airstrike targeting a weapons depot in the capital, Sana'a. The weapon depot is in the heart of the city where the majority of the population lives. So when these airstrikes hit, the weapons depot exploded, and missiles shot out of the mountain, uh, flying to the sides of it. Uh, and so at night when this happens, a lot of people will say that it looks like the sun just came out. Um, and so both are very destructive. Both attacks usually happen in areas where the population is. From the perspective of the southern people, the people who live in the south, um, what's happening there is that they feel like this militia is targeting them personally and is a new form of northern occupation. Uh, there are a lot of diseases that suddenly re-emerged in Aden, including the dengue disease. There are IDPs on both ends of the war. Um, and what the Southerners continuously explain is that they want total Houthi uh, pullout from their area. They do not want them present there. But they also have stated that they believe that the Saudi airstrikes are not solving the problem or doing anything for them. One second. So I'm about to show you a video that I took a few years ago. Uh, none of this happens overnight. The Houthis didn't just appear. The politics of Yemen did not just get complicated. So it's about a questionnaire that I took to the streets of Yemen. In 2011, uh, the Gulf Corporation Council, the GCC, the UN, the US, the UK, uh, and several other countries decided that they, were, they will host a national dialogue conference in Yemen and that this conference will transition Yemen out uh, from a possible civil war into democracy. What this dialogue did was really delay the process of civil war. It allowed everybody a chance to participate. Um, I'll talk more about this dialogue, but before that I want to show you something. Um, there was a project that was part of the dialogue. It was, it was a committee that was dedicated to creating something called uh, transitional justice. 
Um, and so this was talked about a lot in Yemeni media and abroad. And so I took it to the streets and I wanted to see how many people actually understand what that means on the ground. And these are the reactions I got from the people. في اليمن في 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 دائما مش بس مش بس في مفهوم العداله الانتقاليه في نوع من الوصايه بتمارسوا النخب السياسيه والاحزاب على الناس او على الشعب انه بما ان احنا عارفين ما هو هذا الموضوع وما نعمل وما نسوي وما هي مخرجاته ما بش داعي انه الناس تعرف ما بش داعي ندوش راس الناس او يمكن ما بش داعي ان الناس تدوش راسنا مفهوم العداله الانتقاليه هو يمكن مثل واضح على اللي بين بنقوله ما تمش تعريف الناس ما هو مع انه نوقش في مجلس النواب وبعدها رفع وحصل فيه اختلاف ورفع لرئيس الجمهورية وبعدها نعيد مجلس النواب ووزارة الشؤون القانونية كانت داخلة في الموضوع كمان كله كان على مستوى القمة على مستوى الناس ما كانش أحد عارف ما هو لا العادة الانتقالية في الحكومة ماشي ما قد سمعنا شبه هذا ما هي ما قد سمعنا والله في هذا الحادث ما قد سمعناش او اي تطورات في حاجه زي كذا كله ما فيش تقدم ولا تطور ولا اي شيء هو الان بروجرام يعني ماشيين في الحوار تقريبا مش عارف انا مش مطلعه على البروجكت نفسه يعني المشروع ايش ايش عاملين فيه لكن اعتقد انهم بيقربوا وجهات النظر بين الـ بين الـ القوى السياسيه المختلفه انا انا عندي فكره عنها فكره غامضه من من وانا قد انا مطلع وحاولت انا اطلع يعني هو جهد شخصي اقصد ما حدش بذل جهد انه يفترض انه العداله الانتقاليه ما احنا بنتكلم عنها بنتكلم اني تمسني انا شخصيا بما ان انا واحد من افراد هذا الشعب لكن ما ما بذلش اي جهد لتعريفي انا به كل اللي انا عملته انه انا حاولت اطلع حاولت ادور مفهوم في راسي مفهوم غامض انه قد تكون دول مرت في فترات من تاريخها بصراعات من الضروري جدا انه يعني ممكن نقول طي صفحات الماضي جبر الضرر تعويض الضحايا والله يتخيلي انها يعني مرحله ما بين الحكم الذي نطمح اليها والدولة المدنية الذي نرجوها والدولة الذي كانت. العدالة الانتقالية انه يحصل كل مكون مكونات الشعب كحزب او كشباب او كذا على دورهم او حقوقهم في تمثيل سواء كان في منظمات المجتمع المدني او او يعني هذا الاشياء. اذا كان في الوقت الذي سابق ما بش عدالة وينتقل واحد ل شيء جديد يوجد عداله هذه العداله الانتقاليه العداله الانتقاليه هي اخراج اليمن من الوضع الراهن بايجاد قوانين وتشريعات يعني الحكم الرشيد وايجاد القوانين والتشريعات التي تضمن سلامه المواطن وحريته ان شاء الله يعني الانتقال بالسلطه تقاسم السلطه بين جميع ابناء الشعب يعني نقل المركزيه الى 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 حكم لا مركزيه في جميع في جميع المحافظات الانتقال السلمي للسلطه والتداول بين الناس في شكل سلمي ما بين كل طبقات المستحق المجتمع ان تؤدي دورها بدور كامل بخدمه هذا الشعب والارتقاء بافراده الى الى اعلى صوره ممكن. في الحقيقه يعني الحوار اليته مش واضحه يعني لحد الان ايش المخرجات اللي خرجوا بها إن شاء الله إذا في عقول إن شاء الله يصبر اليمن لا خالص ما فيش في ناس مظلومين من الحكومة السابقة ومن الحكومة التي حاليا إن شاء الله هذا في مؤتمر الحوار الجاري على مشان هذا الموضوع لكن من أول ما فيش آه نسمع عنها يعني ولكن للأسف العدالة الانتقالية أصبحت حبرا على ورق والله في معنا ناس مثقفين مطورين يمكن اقدمها الذي بيحب الخير للبلاد هذا الحكومه الشعب من الحكومه ما ما اعتقدش
ان شاء الله عاد لاحظ الحين ما شفنا شيء حاجه ان شاء الله هو اعتقد انه هو خطوه كويسه لكن ام نوت سو اوبتيمستيك اكيد اكيد ان شاء الله طالما في ابناء خيرين من ابناء الوطن اكيد انه بينجح مش 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 اقول متفائل ولا غير متفائل بس اقول انا مش مش فاهم شكرا جزيلا So this was a preview of what was happening on, on Yemeni soil while this national dialogue was taking place. Outside of Yemen, the only thing you heard in the news or saw was that there was a national dialogue and that Yemen was saved. As a matter of fact, President Obama came out and said that there was success in Yemen because that dialogue was completed. Uh, it just shows you the lack of understanding that the world has of Yemen and also the disconnect that was happening between the elites and the ruling elites uh, and the international community versus what was actually happening on the Yemeni soil. Uh, so this national dialogue discussed several topics. First of all, one of the biggest problems and my biggest critique of the national dialogue is that it was composed of 565 members. Right? This was a dialogue after a revolution that was supposed to guarantee that Yemen goes into peace and democracy. Um, so we had nine committees. The, the dialogue was broken down into nine working committees and then they distributed people from different political factions into these groups. Of course, the youth and women had uh, a chunk or a portion and that was very nice and, and great for women and the youth. Uh, and this was, of course, used by every political party and the UN to prove that this dialogue was a great thing and was actually, in fact, succeeding. Um, so as you can see, the smallest group at the very bottom had uh, 40 members, and that was to discuss the issue of Southern separatist, uh, the Southern separatist movement or the idea of separating into two countries. Uh, the Southerners demanded that they want to secede and have two federal states uh, for a few years. Uh, and then maybe have some sort of uh, uh, a vote to decide whether they want to completely split or not. Unfortunately, from the very start, the people who gained the seats to represent the Southern Hirak movement were already not legitimate in the view of the Southern people. The way that they were selected were actually by uh, a list of names that was uh, pre-decided. Um, what that means was that the Southern Hirak uh, representatives did not get a chance to nominate their own people. Uh, a few people sat behind a closed door and decided on a list of names that's going to go in there. Uh, another issue that we see there is the Sada issue, and that's the issue of the Houthi movement, or Ansarullah, like they, they like to be called. And that had 48 members, and they got to discuss their grievances. As a logistical exercise, this dialogue was really, really great. A lot of people got to get lectures from experts from around the world on what governance is, what is a democracy, they had debates for months, actually, about what kind of election systems is ideal in their opinion. While this was all taking place, the situation on the ground in Yemen was not improving. We had a unity government from 2012 until the war started. And this unity government was composed from different parties, which sounds really great for pluralism. However, these different parties refused to work together. They refused to cooperate, meaning that the government failed to perform or carry out any duties. Uh, so water was getting less available. There was less electricity available. And corruption was higher than ever. It was as if these political parties were waiting as opposition for their turn to power just to be as corrupt. Um, and so based on the poor performance of the government and the National Dialogue Conference, people on the ground were getting more and more upset which gave the Houthis opportunity to carry out uh, what they did. But also in other areas, it gave room for other militias and other local leaders to take advantage of the, of the vacuum. And tribal leaders started to become very, very important on the ground. So the National Dialogue proposed this for Yemen. This is a map of a federal system that Yemen was supposed to be in. Uh, the south was split into two portions, the Hadramaut region and then the Adan region, so that's orange and blue. And the north, which really wanted to be one part, was divided into several parts. Um, and so what you see here are locations of where the fighting is really taking place. The Sheba region, Al Jof and Madib, is very, very tribal. And so a lot of tribal leaders are fighting the Houthi presence there on the ground. Uh, and the areas there have been really 
One day the Houthis win, the other day the tribes win. And so it's a constant war on the ground. The area of Al Janad ibn Ta'iz has, uh, has been uh, really a war between the Houthi leaders and militias that belong to the Muslim Brotherhood and other factions that are present on the ground. In Aden, it's very active uh, local population in areas like Abiyan and al -Tala. It's Al-Qaeda and the Arabian Peninsula elements fighting with the Houthis and the military. So the weakest faction on the ground is actually portions of the military that have remained neutral. If you are in the military and you did not side with a local leader, you are targeted by everyone, starting from Al-Qaeda, the Houthis, and everybody else. Um, this map is a little bit problematic because they suggested this map. They've laid out the names of the federal states, but they did not state how this federal system will operate. So what it did is it already, with the deterioration that was happening in the government, with the vacuum, with the power vacuum that was left in place, what this map did is it created a new sense of regionalism amongst the Yemeni people. So for about a year before this started, uh, Yemenis were starting to get the sense of our region is better than yours. And what is really masked as sectarianism is in fact, in its essence, about regionalism. And Yemen has always witnessed regional tensions in the south and in the north from as early as Yemen was created. So this is what Yemen used to be. This is just to show you a comparison. It used to be two countries with that border right there in the middle. And this is how Yemen will be with several borders. Uh, the real problem is here is if this war ends with a deal proposing that federalism starts immediately, what will happen is Yemen will break off to be several countries. So rather than Saudi Arabia having one neighbor or two neighbors, they will really have several neighbors. It could be six, it could be seven, but it will continue to fracture because Yemenis do not want to be led. For example, the people in the north of the north uh, feel like nobody from the south should rule them and vice versa. And so economically, that would be a disaster. Not to mention that a lot of these countries don't have the infrastructure to have their own governments. For example, if the South secedes now, they do not have a military. They do not have the infrastructure of hospitals or schools. And so it's actually in the best interest of all Yemenis to remain as one unit, even though they do not like each other very much at the moment. They need to resolve their problems, restructure the infrastructure, and then probably take a vote on separate, um, on separation. So this is a really great photo. I got really excited when I saw it online. Uh, who you see in the photo here? On the, on the left hand side is the former president of Yemen, Ali Abdullah Saleh. He has allied himself in this war with the Houthis, uh, which is really a great reason to why Saudi Arabia is really, really pissed off. And I'll, I'll go into that in a second. On the right hand side is current president Hadi, who, like I said, is from the south of Yemen. Uh, so former President Saleh, he led Yemen for 33 years. Uh, he managed to play a game of divide and rule whenever he, he ruled Yemen. He uh, was very corrupt. But what he managed to do in 2011 is really unbelievable compared to all the dictators that were in the Middle East. He managed to get a deal out of the transition. So after the revolution took place, he struck a deal with the Gulf Corporation Council and with the endorsement of the Gulf Corporation Council and the UN that he would stay inside of Yemen in his home uh, and he would get a deal of immunity so nobody can ever persecute him as long as he just steps down from power. And so part of this deal was that his vice president would come into power right there, President Hadi. So President Hadi was somebody that everybody could agree on. And a lot of people say that the lack of good performance that we witnessed from Hadi was because former President Saleh put him there for a reason. This is a man who takes orders. He's a military general. During his time of rule in Yemen, he really didn't communicate much with the Yemeni people. This is President Hadi who I'm talking about. He came to the US and went to the Wilson Center and publicly endorsed drone strikes in Yemen. On the ground, drone strikes face a lot of opposition. And so when the president came here and just blindly endorsed drone strikes, a lot of people started to get the impression that President Hadi is a puppet president. And now that he's operating from Riyadh and is endorsing the airstrikes that are coming in into the country, I can say that it's not a good time for him on the ground there. Uh, what is really upsetting everyone, though, is that when President Saleh, former President Saleh, decided to step down, he agreed to not participate in politics ever again. 
Of course, old habits die hard, and he had to strike a deal with the Houthis, and he is now using his former military forces or uh, every military general that still views him as the legitimate leader in Yemen to fight in this war. I believe that the alliance between the Houthis and former President Saleh is an alliance of necessity. Like I mentioned before, his government, Saleh's government, fought six wars with the Houthis, but now they are allied. Saleh killed the, the founder of, uh, the, the head of the Houthi movement before Abdel Malik al Houthi became the leader of this movement. His older brother was the leader, and President Saleh's forces killed him. And so this alliance is a, of a necessity against a Saudi intruder. And I firmly believe that if they are left to their own devices, they could possibly very soon turn against each other. So this is another map of the war that is taking place. Um, this war is claimed on the basis of restoring President Hadi's legitimacy. And so the circles that you see right there in blue are the forces that are fighting for President Hadi. Other than that, the rest is war, is a civil war. This is a map uh, by CNN. Actually, no, Reuters, my apologies. So the last thing I'm going to talk about is Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. The US has been fighting Al-Qaeda in Yemen as early as 1994 when the USS Cole was bombed in Aden. Ever since the US has adopted a policy of uh, it's actually not a policy, but they have used drone strikes to attack their opponents on the ground, which have managed to recruit a lot more fighters. The US looked into Hadi's government as being a good partner in this war against terrorism. However, since this war started, everybody's wondering about the US's interest in fighting Al-Qaeda on the ground. Al-Qaeda is in the highlighted portion that you see where a lot of the Saudi airstrikes are not going, which is very strange. Um, the area of Hadramaut has fallen under the control of Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. So this is where the fighting is happening, the red dots, and this is where Al-Qaeda is. So this is a really interesting photo. The guy that you see at the top pointing his finger upwards, uh, this is Khaled Batarfi, and he is a prisoner who escaped from Hadramaut's prison once the war started. There were a lot of prisoners were able to escape, and a prison break, and a prison break took place today. Um, so prison breaks have become more common during time of war, and um, he escaped and went into the presidential palace. And this is a photo of him pointing his finger upwards and stepping on the Yemeni flag. Uh, when they went to Hadramaut, they were able to rob the central bank there. And uh, they are now operating in Hadramaut through a cover. They have created a faction called uh, Abna Hadramaut that is going to speak for them so they don't have to participate directly in politics. The problem is Hadramaut is a country with two oil sites and uh, they could fall in the hands of Al-Qaeda. Most importantly, what's happening here is Al-Qaeda has announced that their biggest enemy is the Houthi faction and former President Saleh. And this is an official announcement that their official media site put up. They put a reward of 20 kilograms of gold as a bounty for the heads of the Houthi leader and former President Saleh. And so by default, uh, Saudi Arabia and AQAP seem to have managed uh, an alliance of some sort. And it's really, really bizarre considering that the US is uh, providing logistical support for the Saudi-led coalition. Um, the real disaster of this war is that the more Saudi Arabia targets Yemen, the more the Houthis are able to recruit. The Houthi movement is, again, a militia movement. They're not a legitimate leader. They're not a government. The more the Houthis expand, the more Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula is able to recruit. So that leaves us to the role of the US. And I prefer to answer that in the form of Q&A, if you guys want, because I know I, my time has come to an end. Um, staff is collecting question cards. We already have a few, so we'll get started. Um, we'll start off with the recent uh, UN-backed peace talks in Geneva were basically labeled unsuccessful. Um, so 
What are your thoughts and insights into what other options are available for Yemen and the international community? So since this war started, there were two conferences that took place that were supposed to end this crisis. The first conference took place in Riyadh. Uh, this conference, of course, did not have any Houthi or former uh, representatives of former President Saleh. So it was uh, more of a declaration of intention, really. Uh, what they used is uh, UN resolutions, UN Security Resolution number 2216, to say that they will not negotiate with the Houthis unless they implement Resolution 2216, which stated that the Houthis retract back to Saada and that former President Saleh uh, stops participating in politics. So given everything that we saw, I think it's very unlikely that the Houthis retract or that President Saleh hands over power. The Geneva Conference was actually uh, a process that gave people on the ground a lot of hope, but once they showed up in Geneva, it was uh, a repeat of the same scenario where the forces that represented uh, President Hadi were trying to pressure the Houthis and uh, forces of uh, President Saleh to step down and, and, and stay away. So it seems that both sides of this party are not coming into the negotiations in hopes of reaching a solution. And I think that a solution can be easily reached uh, if President Hadi and the Houthis can even strike a deal. Uh, they don't need an elaborate conference. In Oman, it's stated that the US is somehow pressuring for talks, and there have been secret talks taking place in Oman. Um, a lot of details about this remain unknown. If the situation continues, what is the likelihood of Yemen splitting again? So, like I said earlier, the really good thing about this war is that Iran has not actively participated in this war and the nuclear deal is holding them back. If Iran decides to go in and fight, then this war will turn on to be a very, very long war. Uh, this is day number 95 of the war, meaning that there is possibly no end in sight. Uh, the people in Riyadh have not been clear about what they want to achieve in Yemen. Now with the four month there, uh, their four month there, they don't, they don't seem to know or have an exit plan. So uh, it seems like they've, they've managed themselves to stay there for a while and Yemen could in fact secede. But like I said earlier, they would probably split to five or six states. You mentioned that the taking of Sana'a was pretty much overnight. They just came and the next morning they were there. Why was that so easy? That's actually a really, really good question. Uh, it seems that President Hadi may have known about this beforehand. Um, prior to that, the Muslim Brotherhood was a strong political party on the ground in the Middle East and the Muslim Brotherhood Party in Yemen was known as Islah, and they had a lot of ministerial posts in the government. And they had a military leader uh, in the military who was kind of following the lead of Islah. Uh, it seems that President Hadi was unhappy with their role in Yemen and wanted to kind of eliminate them because they were bothering him. They were interfering or overstepping him. He wasn't able to do anything because they had their own agenda that was very separate from him. So a lot of people say that when the Houthis came into Sana'a, President Hadi was aware of it as long as they get rid of the Muslim Brotherhood branch and they got rid of the, and they really did fight only the military branches in the military that belong to uh, General Ali Muhsin, who supports Islah's party. Uh, I think that after they stepped into Sana'a, had, President Hadi thought that he could find a partner in the Houthis, but then he discovered that they were allied with the forces of former President Saleh, and that's when it became really personal for him. It was back to former President Saleh versus President Hadi, and there's this general taste of uh, this being a very personal, personal war. Uh, you've talk, we've talked a little bit about uh, Saudi's influence and uh, possibly Iran's influence in this situation. Besides Saudi Arabia and Iran, are there any other countries that, are, that have a big influence on Yemen? So 
In 2011, Iran extended their hand to several groups, not just to the Houthi movement, that is Zaidi. They were supporting young women and journalists, any activists. They even funded branches of the southern separatist movement, Hirak. So they were really wanting to influence Yemeni politics in any way they can. It just happens that the Houthis managed to be the strongest out of them. Uh, besides that, the, we have Qatar and Turkey supporting the Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, so there was one shipment of arms that Iran was trying to send into Yemen that was stopped. But what nobody fails to, what everybody fails to mention is that there were several shipments that were coming from Turkey into Yemen of weapons as well. Uh, during the time of 2011 to 2014, Yemen's relationship with Turkey and Qatar became uh, very, very good and they became very, very close. So Turkey opened an exchange program to Yemenis and they were in the process of uh, launching a program of not only university exchanges, but of opening Turkish universities in Yemen. Um, Qatar was able to grant a lot of people um, some sort of assistance. Uh, the Nobel Peace Prize winner, Tawakkul Karman, was granted the Turkish citizenship and has a house in Qatar. Um, a lot of the factions that are Islamist of some sort or belong to the Muslim Brotherhood have managed to have very good relationships with these two countries. Um, so Iran may not be directly um, influencing the outcome of everything that's going on right now, but Iran did propose some sort of a peace plan. Can you tell us a little bit about this and also what Yemen's reaction was to this peace plan? Uh, everything that Iran has taken in this war is really for show. Everything is for show. So when the Saudi airstrikes hit a UN building, the first to condemn it was, of course, Iran. When this war started, the first to call for peace was Iran, because guess what? Although they're not participating in this, they are benefiting from the publicity. This is unbelievable publicity. They didn't have to lift a finger, and their name is mentioned all the time. Um, I don't think that Iranian participation is welcomed on the ground from Yemenis. Um, we have quite a few members uh, that have been involved in oil and gas and, and the industry here in Houston. So we have a couple of questions about, you mentioned that some oil fields were bombed, etc. But who actually has control of the oil fields in the country right now? That's really, really hard to exactly tell. But we know that the areas of Marib and Hadramaut, where these oil sites are, uh, there's a lot of conflict going there. So Marib is, is a place where active civil war is taking place, and Hadramaut is a portion of land that is under uh, Al-Qaeda rule. There were rumors that a tribal sheikh from the north of Yemen uh, with the last name of Al-Ahmar was going to come to Hadramaut and take control of Hadramaut, uh, take it, you know, and kind of rescue it from the possible attacks of the Houthis. The people in Hadramaut are very frustrated and upset because although they have oil in their governorate, they don't actually uh, get any portion of the wealth. So they're very poor. Uh, and so in the past few years, ever since 2011, a movement known as al habba al-Shabiya, which means uh, popular uprisings, uh, took place in Hadramaut. This is a movement of the local population, Hadramaut demanding to participate uh, in the oil business somehow. Um, they feel very frustrated because this is a country where a lot of conflict takes place because of the oil, but they don't actually get a chance to take advantage of any of it. Uh, and so if there is a governorate that is likely to, see, to secede, it's probably Hadramaut. But I think that Al-Qaeda's presence there in the past few years, um, a lot of Hadramis on the ground have told me that they think uh, Al-Qaeda's participation or presence in Hadramaut is not a coincidence, but is actually part of a political agenda to make sure that Hadrami people do not actually secede and take control of that wealth. Having said that, uh, while the oil sites are bombed and are uh, probably not working at the moment, there are a few factions that are operating around it. There are always oil smugglers uh, who are smuggling oil to other sites and are benefiting from that. Uh, there was a personality that was known in Yemen to have uh, managed a lot of the corruption around oil sites. He was granted a PhD scholarship and was sent to Egypt. What are, what are some possibilities that what's happening in Yemen may spill over to other countries, specifically to Oman, um, where the ailing sultan hasn't really named the next um, successor? 
So this spilling to Oman is actually really unlikely. Oman has managed to stay uh, neutral throughout most of the Gulf's politics. It's the only country that did not participate in the coalition that is hitting Yemen at the moment. And they are using Oman as a possible place for negotiations. And this has not been made official, uh, possibly because Oman has not fully accepted that Oman is used as a place for negotiations. They want to stay out of this as much as they can. Uh, this spilling over into Riyadh or into Saudi Arabia is a lot more of a likelihood. Uh, we've heard about uh, fighting that is happening in the border where the Houthis have managed to push into Najran in Saudi Arabia. And uh, yesterday there were talks of a Scud missile uh, heading in the direction of Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia has not confirmed nor denied this, but the Houthi sides have said that they have launched this attack. Uh, what this war is doing, if it does not end, it really is inviting trouble into Saudi Arabia. And I do believe that it's in Saudi Arabia's best interest if the monarchy uh, wishes to stay in power to end this conflict as soon as possible before Iran decides to participate or before uh, it grows out of hand. Because four months of fighting means that they are at a stalemate again and nobody's winning. The Saudis have not been able to win this. Talking about Saudi Arabia, in the beginning of your talk, you mentioned that Saudi Arabia started trying to spread Wahhabism in uh, Yemen. How successful has this been? And also another part of this question about Saudi Arabia, uh, how are Yemenis living in Saudi Arabia viewed by the Saudis? So to answer the first question, um, Wahhabism has been in Yemen for a very, very long time and they have been very successful in spreading Wahhabi thought into Yemen. Um, in Afghanistan and Pakistan, uh, they were able to create something called madrasas. Madrasas were, were also present in Yemen. Uh, they were everywhere, but what former President Saleh did is he was able to uh, continue the absorption of Wahhabis into the system. Uh, former President uh, Al-Hamdi, he's the president of the north of Yemen, he allowed uh, for the Wahhabis to enter the country and to open the madrasas. And then former President Saleh decided to absorb them into the official educational system. And the reason he did that is because these uh, clerks were receiving money directly from Saudi Arabia. By absorbing, him, uh, absorbing them into the official system, the money would go through him onto them. Therefore, they would listen to him more than they are to listen to Saudi Arabia. Or that was what he was thinking. In a recent interview that he gave to Al-Mayadeen channel, he openly stated that after the war of 1994, he granted Islamists um, some rights, and not just Islamists, but also jihadis. There is a clerk known as uh, Abdel Majid Zindani. He is on the US's uh, top wanted list. He has a university in Yemen, um, and this university was opened by the approval of former President Saleh. And in this interview, he said that it was a reward for his uh, support during the war in 1994. So he, former President Saleh, really operated on this reward system. He didn't really care for uh, the well-being of the Yemeni people, but was more concerned about him remaining in power. Uh, and because of that, very radical ideas were able to spread throughout Yemen. And in the south of Yemen, a lot of people welcomed the Wahhabi ideology, uh, probably because they were targeted a lot for being Marxist prior to 1990, meaning that they didn't have a religion. So to overcompensate, they were very eager to embrace uh, the Sunni sect of Islam. We've got this slide up here about the role of the US. And of course, our members are very concerned as to how we can help and what would be the best step for the US to take. Can you give us a little bit more details on the role that the US could possibly play towards uh, bettering the situation in Yemen? So the US looks really confused in the Middle East, right? Uh, I think it was John Stewart who said that, it was, it was on TV and I thought it was brilliant the way he put it. So in Iraq, uh, the US is fighting alongside Iran against ISIS, but in Yemen they're fighting alongside Saudi Arabia to fight Iran. So the US has managed to create a proxy against itself. Um, the role of the US is really confusing in Yemen. I feel like they are in a tough corner. They want to show support to Saudi Arabia because of the nuclear deal. They want to say, OK, we are about to welcome a new friend here, but you guys are really the original friend. You know, The relationship that the US has with Saudi Arabia is, is one that is very strong. And so in a sense, 
A lot of people in the Middle East feel like the U.S. handed over the Yemen file to Saudi Arabia and told them to do whatever they want with it as long as they get to, de to sign the nuclear deal. On the other hand, uh, the U.S. is very concerned about Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula and has fought terrorism, again, as early as 1994. So why would they just completely ignore what's happening there? Um, so since the start of this war, uh, the U.S. has actually tried to launch a few drone strikes into Yemen and was able to kill a few um, what they call extremists. Of course, on the ground, you can't really verify that during times of war. So who knows if they are actually hitting the targets that they want. What's also more interesting is that the U.S. supplied Saudi Arabia with a lot of the weapons that they're using. Some of the weapons that they have used in Sada, the Sada province where the Houthis are from, uh, are weapons that are known as cluster bombs. <laughs> cluster bombs are illegal in a lot of countries around the world because they, they create damage for years and years and years, way after a war uh, has ended. Uh, they operate as a form of a mine. So if you have children nearby, this, this could explode. A cluster bomb could explode even 40, 50 years after a war has taken place. Another weapon that is very controversial is something that is known as a bunker buster. Uh, to this day, nobody could actually verify whether that weapon was used or not, but a lot of the people on the ground have reported uh, the, the after, uh, af after they were hit by these weapons, they were reporting sensations and, uh, and things that resemble a bunker buster. Of course, not having experts on the ground means that there is no accountability. Uh, when the Saudis targeted weapon depots in Yemen, they were targeting mountains. Uh, what former President Saleh did is he found uh, areas in the heart of the capital of Sana'a. He found mountains. He dug a hole very, very, very deep inside the mountain and hid a bunch of Scud missiles in there and a bunch of other weapons in there. And so what Saudi Arabia did when they launched their airstrikes is they were trying to penetrate these mountains to degnate all these bombs and all these weapons. And so uh, since for, for 95 days now, they've been hitting a lot of the same sites. So if you go into Sana'a, there are a lot of jokes about how it's kind of like a bus stop because they go around the same areas over and over again for 95 days. Um, the reason that we believe it's a bunker buster is because these weapons would go into a mountain and then penetrate very deep into the mountain, dignating the weapons um, and the weapons once they explode, they would create a mushroom cloud that looks like a nuclear explosion. And what the city would feel are several earthquakes based on that. And when this weapon was used, um, 60 people dropped dead the first time they used what we think is a bunker buster. I cannot confirm that. But there was a weapon that was used once where 60 people who are as far as six miles away from where this took place uh, fell dead. Um, the day that this took place, there was a huge media bubble that surrounded this event. When this war started, Saudi Arabia decided to call it Operation Decisive Storm. It has a very American name, by the way. Um, when this event took place in April, the day right after that, there was a huge, huge uh, media conference stating that the Saudi-led coalition has ended phase one of the operation, which is Operation Decisive Storm, and have started Operation Restoring Hope. So a lot of people thought that the targeting of the airstrikes would stop, but to this day they have not stopped. But what they did do is turn the world's attention away from what weapon they used on that day. Please join me in thanking Ms. Alhamdani.